is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School lesson today. Again, we're in the book of Revelations, the third chapter, beginning with verses 14 through 22. Uh, the title of this lesson is Sufficient in Christ Alone. God provides all that we need as we pursue Christ every day. This letter that John wrote was to Laodicea. And it was about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia. So there was a, a route there. You go down southeast, and it would have been probably the last stop on the postal circuit before the rider returned to Ephesus, which was on the coast at that time. So that gives you some idea of where we are. Now, this particular city was big and bikey. It had a, uh, evidently they kept a lot of money on hand because when Cicero, Cicero passed through there, he was able to cash big bank checks there in their draft. So this was sort of neat, having a good bank there. They also had sheep, which produced a glossy black wool, and it was unrivaled at anywhere in that region. In addition to that, they had a Pergian powder that was effective in healing eye defects. Rub this powder on your eyes, make them better. In addition to that, they used some of this to make a salve which you could put on your ears. Now, some of you old timers can remember in the days, your younger days, that your mom probably made sort of a hot oil, warm maybe, but hot, and put it in your ear when you had an earache. Now, if you didn't have that, then I guess that's before your time. But we had some of that. It was a kind of a sweet oil. This, was a save that was made there in this city, and it was for healing of the ears. The city contained a temple to Men Karu, the God of healing. How about that? The God of healing was the place that people came to worship. And so they gave this God the credit for producing such wonderful drugs that they could apply to their eyes and their ears. They uh, had a good hospital program, so I'm told. And so this particular God, Men Karu, was, he was responsible for the healing. The city really looked great from the outside, but the church itself was struggling. The water supply was insufficient. As a matter of fact, they really didn't have any local means of producing water. They just didn't have it. So Laodicea set a pipeline all the way up six miles to the Nitzli. It was six miles where they had hot springs. 
And so they put pipes in there and they ran it all down six miles till it got to Laodicea. And it was started out hot from the hot springs. When it got to town though, it was lukewarm. Wasn't cold, lukewarm. You like drinking lukewarm water? Well, that's kind of what they had. Now, I don't remember if they had any ice back then or not, but there were cool springs. One of the places nearby, uh, I say nearby, it was longer than six miles out. They had a cool, refreshing water. And that's the kind people like to drink. Now, along with this six miles of bringing the water in, in addition to the fact that it was warm, the pipes picked up sediment along the way, and it was a mineral sediment. So the taste of water was not very good. You ever had uh, sulfur water or something like that? There's a place in Indian Springs on the other, the south side of Atlanta, and folks go by there with their gallon jugs and they get some of that sulfur water, and it's supposed to be good for you. Uh, when I was just a kid, my dad and my wife's cousin, Roy, they had uh, a business together and they built houses and other things. And one day we went out to a place, oh, two counties over, and it was kind of out in the woods. And they had a lot of places out there where they had summer camps for adults, summer camps for children. And so dad and Roy, we're working out there and we got to play it all. The water was terrible. About the only way you could drink that water was to put Kool-Aid in it. Stirred up real good. Now, I didn't drink coffee then, but I would imagine that's how my mom and dad got started, putting coffee in and then sprinkling a little salt on it. Try and cut some of that harsh flavor out of the water there. Probably the same is true. Now, I don't know whether these folks uh, drank coffee or not, but if they did, I'm sure they probably had to neutralize it in some fashion. We like our water clear and pure. In this particular city, that wasn't the case. It came from hot springs. It was mediocre or lukewarm when it arrived, and so they had to sit around for a while. As we begin here with our scripture, taking a verse 14, it says, Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, Thus says the Amen. Uh, Y'all ever say Amen in church? Sometimes I enjoy watching some of these preachers. Say, now, y'all, give me an Amen. And some people do. Some do it without even being asked. Amen usually means I'm in agreement with what you're saying. And it is also a term we use to close a prayer. Amen, meaning it's finalized. Thus say the amen, the faithful and true witness, that's Jesus, the originator of God's creation. Jesus was with God when he created this world that we live in. Verse 15 says, I know your works. They're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Don't like lukewarm stuff. I don't like lukewarm coffee. I take it up to the microwave and push the buttons and make sure it's hot. Lukewarm coffee just doesn't do much to me. I know some of y'all like iced coffee and that's great if you like it that way. Uh, but <laughs> that's the other extreme. If it's not real cold or not hot, I don't care for the in-between stuff any more than Jesus did when he was telling this city. You don't have the right stuff. So as we continue, it says, For you say, I'm rich. 
I have become wealthy and I need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Oh my. Now, we don't need anything. When the earthquake happened in that part of Asia, a lot of cities were damaged, just for one of them. Uh, they decided, along with all the other cities, hey, we've got the money, we'll, we'll recoup and rebuild everything. One of the things that I truly enjoy here in America is the way that folks band together to help each other out. And every time we have tornado runs in Mississippi and Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Georgia, folks go out and help. And they take things with them. They take lots of today, bottled water, <coughs> excuse me, and other things because they like to, to help out their fellow man. And I think this is the way God intended it for us to be in communities, is to be helpful. This particular city decided on their own, they take care of their needs. We don't need anything. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 65, verses 16 and 17 says, whoever asks for a blessing in the land will ask for a blessing by the God of truth. Who is the God of truth? Well, that's Jesus. And here's what happens. Former troubles will be forgotten and hidden from my sight. I will create new heavens and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Jesus Christ is the amen. He's an affirmation and a certainty. Now, the cool, refreshing water of Colossae was one of the reasons that the city was founded there because of that water. Hierapolis, on the other hand, had hot springs for water and its water supply. So there were extremes there. Uh, same is true in Georgia. Warm Springs has got one thing, and they have the warm water. Oft times in the mountains, you'll find colder streams. And nothing <laughs> used to be any better than me than pass by a place, and we had one in my hometown, where it, the water came in in the pipe. I think they finally stopped it up. But you, you could go by there and get the coolest drink. Oh, it was refreshing. And I didn't taste any minerals in it. Now, whoever asked for a blessing to the God of truth, all their former troubles will be forgotten. When you and I accept Jesus, as our savior, we inherit an insurance policy that places us in a wonderful place at the end of this life and the beginning of a new one. We're gonna be in paradise. And that's cut and dry. Now, we'll still sin. Um, maybe I do more than some of you folks do. But when we do, and we go to the God of truth and we ask for forgiveness. He gives it to us. And this, this is so clear here. It says, former troubles will be forgotten and hidden from God's sight. He does it all the time. When I was 65, I was in the hospital, had an operation. The surgeon didn't do a very good job. Uh, he punctured my lung, and so he was trying to explain to me what happened, and I'm sitting there like, he said, oh, that's right, we, we gave you that amnesiac so you would remember. I was unable to talk, they had me all plugged up with stuff. And I said, it worked. He knew what I meant. I didn't remember anything. God created the amnesiac drug. He applies it to himself every time we ask for forgiveness of our sins. He says, I put it in the deep blue sea. 
your sins are as far as the east is from the west. If you start out going east, you'll never get there. If you start out going west, you'll never get there. That's how far God places our sins. He does not see them. They're not within his sight. And it's one of the most wonderful things that you and I have to experience. As we continue in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed, and your shameful nakedness not disposed, and the ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. So be zealous and repent. Jesus said this, as many as I love, I will rebuke and discipline. And we need that discipline. When we repent, it takes care of the sin in our lives. It just shuffles it off somewhere else. He says, if you'll wear white clothes so that you may be dressed and your nakedness will not be exposed. I saw something cute on Facebook. Facebook this week. A little boy went in the bathroom. His mother's in the shower and she couldn't find her clothes. And so he looked down on the floor and he said, he picked up a leaf that was in there and he said, here, mom, this is what Adam and Eve used. And so I've often wondered when they made themselves clothes out of leaves. Uh, I'm thinking, were leaves different then than they are today? I mean, who would want to wear clothes made out of I, I leaves, but this little boy was following the scriptures with it. He was giving his mother a means of covering herself. The Bible says we will be given rubs of white purity. Now, what does that mean? Well, when we ask for forgiveness of our sins and God grants it to us, we have a white garment because it is purified by the blood of Jesus. And it's as white as white can be. They, this blood signifies the purity of those whose sins are cleansed with Christ's blood. Verse 20 says, See, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Verse 21 says, To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22 says, let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this opens the door, Christ said. I'll come and eat with him. Uh, when Jesus was living in among the Jews, he was a Jew. He broke all the rules. He did uh, he let his disciples eat grain on the Sabbath, and uh, they didn't even wash their hands. I mean, that, that was just not good. Uh, he, he sat down at the table oft times with sinners, and that was not good, according to the rabbis, according to the Jewish elect. I mean, this, this wasn't good, because he didn't follow their rules. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and 11 says, he will share a meal with all sinners who have been redeemed. You and I will be able to share a meal with Christ. Luke says, chapter 13, verse 29, the disciples would participate with Christ in his kingdom by sitting on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, we will all sit with him. Now, did you have uh, certain rules at your table when you were growing up? My brother, my dad, and I 
were always supposed to wear a shirt. Not an undershirt, not a pajama shirt, a shirt that was expected. As a matter of fact, we didn't need to, we had one on. We were also expected to come to the table without a cap on our head. And if we went out, same thing applied. We're supposed to be dressed, but not wear a hat during the meal. That was just part of my mother's particular idea of what we should do, and it was good. I respected that. Uh, at times, I didn't particularly want to get dressed to eat, and so when I went to college, sometimes I, I'd eat my bed. Boy, sometimes I had crackers all over that bed. I mean, it just, but I'm sure y'all never did anything like that, but you can take my word for it. It's a little uncomfortable when you do that. John's going to share a meal with us. Now, we, we have certain rules. Many of the old timers remember when families had family reunions. Don't hear about it much anymore, once in a while. Now, one of the things I found interesting was uh, a fellow by the name of Jimmy Sharp from Lake City. He, he was a cousin of ours, and Betty, when he, when he came, he brought a big old tub full of drinks. I mean, there was everything in chocolate, strawberry, you name it. There were kinds of drinks in there I'd never seen. So, oh my goodness, what a feast. But we have a ritual there too. Uh, Uncle Vic and Aunt Minnie, they got to eat first. Now friends, they were our age, mine and some of you, but they got to eat first. Now, sometimes I hope that's happened to you, that you get your plate filled first. That's the way it was. Then as things grew up a little bit, when we, got a little bit older. It seems the rule changed. We started getting the kids to bed first. I guess we wanted to get them out of the way, so give them some food and then let them go play. Uh, so I always considered we were a part of the skipped generation. First it was our grandparents, grand uncles, aunts, whatever. Then it was our kids. Now today, some of you are put first, and it is a nice thing. And I've talked to so many of you, and I know that your children and grandchildren have taken care of you in the same way that folks have married them. And I'm extremely grateful for that. And I'm grateful for a God who does not remember my sins. Before this day is out, if you're like me, you're probably going to commit some sins. Uh, I hate to admit it, but many of mine are on the highway. Uh, sometimes when some numbskull zips by me, I want to roll my window down and say, careful friend, so you can dance at your parents' wedding, or, or something like that. That's not necessarily good, but that's how I feel. It just rubs me the wrong way. We have to take our time and we take up God's time sometimes by asking him to forgive us of the transgressions that we have committed. And the older I get, the more I can see that I've done that's been wrong. And so I have to ask for forgiveness often. And I think God likes for us to be specific. It's not enough for, the, for me to say, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I, I screwed up today. I didn't do this. Or... What's even worse is that I have felt the Spirit leading me to do something or contact someone and I did not do it. And that's happened to me a couple of times where I felt moved to contact a friend. And before I got that job done, either out of forgetfulness or busyness, that person died and that'll take the starch out of your, your system because you then knew you should have done it. God forgives you though, and that's a wonderful thing. And friends, Christ is indeed sufficient for us. He's all we need. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you sent your son to us. We're grateful that the Holy Spirit now resides in us because when we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, 
you gave us the Spirit. Help us to listen to the things that we should listen to and that we abide by the things that you would like for us to do, which may include studying more, reading the Bible more, going to church more, having more fellowship with Christians, and living a life that shows others that we as Christians are separate. Dear God, we thank you for everything you give us, all of the treats in this life, and all those yet to come. We express our appreciation. We praise you, and we thank you for that, and we ask this in his name. Amen. Friends, look forward to seeing you next week. We'll begin studying something other than these letters that are recorded in Revelations. Have a good week.